This is Aotearoa, the land of the long white cloud, and more especially New Zealand's South Island, an artist's dream dominated by the great Southern Alps. The South Island, more affectionately known by its residents as mainland New Zealand, has as the principal city Christchurch. Hello everyone, I'm Andy Nisbet, welcoming you to the city that shines. Christchurch, the English city of the Southern Pacific, was first settled in 1840 by families from the United Kingdom, who arrived at the port of Littleton, climbed the hills surrounding that port, and were able to see before them the vast plains of Canterbury Province. Christchurch now has a population of around three to 400,000, a few of whom can be seen here in the city's focal area, Cathedral Square, while the Canterbury Province has a much larger population, the bigger percentage of which are sheep, which don't get into the city much. Cathedral Square has been made into a pedestrian's paradise, a place for meeting family and friends, a place to sit and watch the many events that take place, or visiting the building that dominates the square and for many years dominated the Christchurch skyline, the Anglican Cathedral. The cathedral is a sanctuary for many people and a quiet place to sit and pray that the stock market won't crash again and that the government won't raise the taxes any more. Christchurch has always been known as the Garden City and can boast many different parks and reserves. Everywhere you look there is colour, like the floral clock with colours changing from season to season. The Bowker Fountain, by night a blaze of alternating colours, by day a meeting place and bathhouse for the seagulls. Christchurch's main show and convention centre is the Town Hall, built on the banks of the Avon River, with the Ferrier Fountain working as a shower unit for all the ducks frequenting that area. The Town Hall restaurant offers high quality dining and a view across Victoria Square to the statue of Queen Victoria, who may or may not be amused by the goings on around her. The banks of the Avon provide an ideal spot for a picnic and with the vast amount of bird life about, there is never any problem with food scraps. In fact, it is wise to keep your food very close to you. The city of Christchurch has two main rivers. The Heathcote flows mainly through residential areas, and of course the Avon, which meanders its way through both residential and the main business areas. The majority of Christchurch city and suburbs is built on the flat, and this has allowed for many sporting facilities to be built. In the 1940s and 50s, in a suburb called Aranui, there was a speedway stadium. That in itself is not surprising, but what is interesting is that three people who for many years dominated World Speedway all got their first taste for and first rides on the Aranui Speedway track. Between them, 12 world titles, a proud record for New Zealand's big three of Speedway, Ronnie Moore, Barry Briggs and Ivan Major. And in this video, it is the first, Ronnie Mirak Moore, arguably the most talented of them all, that we devote the next couple of hours. So sit back and relax with the champ as he lets us in on what Merrick is doing in the 90s.
Hi, Shane. Hey. How are you? All right, thanks. Where's Ronnie? Is he about? In the garage. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's fun. Yeah. I mean, he hurt his leg, but it was fun. Some of your old shadow mates, of course, are into that. Roger Wright and all those guys. Yep. I heard you had a bit more of a leisurely run a couple of Sundays ago down the Waimak River, just out of Christchurch here. Oh, yeah, that was just a Sunday afternoon. Um, we shot out there. It had been raining. It was a nice sunny day, but it had been raining, so lots of lovely bogs and river up and everything else. And oh, We motored across a few bug holes and things like that to start off with. And we thought, Try the river. And uh, I didn't know it at the time. I didn't discover it till the end of the day, but I wasn't in four wheel drive. I thought I'd click it in, but I hadn't. I was only in two wheel drive, so you know, we crossed the rivers, but I was having a little bit of fun getting in and out of some of them. And after we'd done all that, there was a nice little mound there, and I hit that. I got on the top of it, and that was it. I was stuck. I see you've actually got a couple of these particular machines, the uh, the RLM speed wagon, the red one. What sort of units that one? Oh, that just a standard series one Land Rover. I've had that one for quite a few years, actual fact. I've just managed to get another one there with a big diesel motor in, but I'm still working on that one before I take it and break it in on rivers. I hope it goes through rivers. I certainly hope so, and you've got a newer one. That you're doing a fair amount of work on that, obviously. You're going to make it one of the smarter ones around? Uh, well, there are plans ahead to do that, but whether it will develop or not, I don't really know. You've got quite a few friends to go out with you, um, old Speedway buddies. Yep. Uh, two real regular guys, Dennis Nicholls and Roger Wright. We're always going off together. Oh, well, sometimes Alan Brown, who I work with. But Alan, one's still bashed up from when he turned it upside down in the river one time. He hasn't got around to straightening it out yet. I know some of these tracks around here, of course, are pretty bumpy. You have pretty good upholstery in that wagon of yours? <laughs> no, <laughs> you can't have things like that. It all floats away when the land rubber floods. You don't have to worry about that. You just strap yourself in and, well, absorb the bumps. But it's a numb bum. <laughs> Definitely. What sort of machine is the other one that we've um, got on that day out there? Uh, that's a Series 2 Land Rover, but it's got a Mitsubishi diesel motor in, which is terrific. That'll plug through anything that well. Of course, when I came round today, you were doing a fair amount of work on your Land Rover. 
and uh, obviously uh, had a bit of a catch up somewhere. Yeah, well, I thought I was in four wheel drive and I wasn't. And I got bailed up. And of course, uh, the exhaust pipe and all that kind of stuff is underneath it. Uh, sort of rides on that a little bit and sort of bends and twists things a bit now and again. But it all straightened out. Obviously very, very handy. Obviously every one of these has a spade in the back, I suppose, does it? <laughs> yeah. Dig you out of problems? Definitely. Uh, one of the main things any time in a Land Rover when you're doing things like this is not to do it by yourself. You must always have company with you. So if something like this happens, cable, snatch, and nine times out of ten you come out. And obviously they're very, very strong. They certainly take a fair amount of uh, hammering, don't they? Well, they take hammering all the time. That's where, basically, it's stupid to titivate when it's all nice and pretty, paintwork and everything else, because it doesn't last very long. Yeah, right, especially when you're going through or making your own trails, as we were talking about. Yeah, I mean, this is just a, a nice, well, basically a smooth riverbed. This is nothing. But up in there, when you get up in the mountains and the Alps, well, you've got to force trees apart to get through, and then uh, paintwork doesn't really matter certainly wouldn't want to do a um, very expensive duco job on any of those. Good crash bars. Yeah, uh, you definitely need those. Especially when you go over a river bank sometimes. You think you're just going to ease down into a river, but that river's been washed away, and you take a nosedive. <laughs> if you haven't got a crash bars, you've got the motor back on your left, I think. You go through many tyres? Basically, tyres are bad. Um, and when you're using it on the road, you've got them the other way around so you're not wearing your treads out. And then you turn them round so they get the ultimate grip when you're out in the rust up. You can get the walls of the tyres sliced at times, so then that's a, a new tyre. But nine times out of ten, they're not too bad. Not many machines on the road these days that can go anywhere. Well, there is a good old English tradition there. I mean, my Land Rover is 1954. Now that's an old Land Rover, but it will still go anywhere, and that's terrific. The Wymac River, of course, the water comes straight off the mountains. It'll be pretty cold out there. Oh, well, it can get a little bit chilly at times, but usually when you're in a situation like this, the cold doesn't seem to affect you. You don't worry about it. I mean, after it's all over, you can freeze to death, but while you're actually out there driving and having fun, you don't feel the cold. Concentrating on what you're doing, obviously. Well, yeah. It's the deepest sort of water that you've ever been into. Well, it depends totally on the terrain. I mean, there's Roger Wright now. That, in the summertime, is just a normal trail. And he's got stuck in the wheel rut, so it takes him a little bit to get out. But normally, it's no problem at all. You just blast straight through all this. I suppose you all give each other a hard time when you uh, get stuck. <laughs> well, there quite a few French words spoken at times, so it's all part of it, fun. Or is it a family table, keep those out of the moment? <laughs> the kids obviously enjoy going out for the day as well. Oh, the kids really love it. They, in fact, they get quite upset if they can't come with us. They really enjoy that. They go to school on Monday and tell the kids about this. Right. Crossing these rivers, I don't suppose you have any problems with jet motors. No, not really. It's uh, we have had a few where they've been a little bit iffy, and once upon a time, a few months back, way up in the Alps, not here, Alan Brown turned right over, and he was trapped underneath. And it was a superhuman effort by a chap who managed to get the Land Rover up enough to get Alan out. And uh, oh, he was really bad; his leg was nearly cut off. And we had to get the Air Force to fly in a helicopter and get him out. But normally. Well, we can get over on our side and just roll them back and carry on. There are many other riverbeds around the Canterbury area that you get into, like the Wymac's nice and close to town, but there are other ones, aren't there? There's quite a few, actually. In fact, sometimes, oh, we, a couple of years back, we made a habit of going just about to every river in Canterbury. But fundamentally, a river is a river. And this is only 15 miles away from home, so go to this one. There and back in quick time. It's uh, full of little islands really, isn't it, this Waymac? It's sort of water everywhere, but uh, a lot of shingle and boulders and so forth. Yes, it depends totally on how the snow is melting up in the Alps. Uh, at the moment, it's so damn cold, it's not really melting that much. Uh, the river isn't as deep as it normally is. 
and Bokey can be parked on a little island, but all of a sudden a surge comes down and that little island disappears, so you've got to be a bit careful you don't get trapped. Good to see you there with uh, a can of Coke. It is Coke too. I know, well, I realise that. <laughs> Not drinking and driving, good to see that, Ronnie. Quite a good spread of vehicles out there for that day. Yeah, well, all you got to do is pick up the phone and let the boys know you're going out, and they tell someone else and so on and so forth. And, well, sometimes we can have 10 or 15 of us there. Good backdrop, isn't it? It's beautiful that, scenery out there. That is where our water is coming from, from those mountains up there. Plenty of water going through. Of course, you can wash them while you're having fun. Yeah, well, it, it cleans everything up quite good, except after you leave the river, you go over muddy trails to get out into the main road again get all covered in mud again. So when you get home, it's out with the water again? Yeah, the hose and down the driveway, and hope it all washes out on the main road. Four-wheel drive, obviously, the way to go rather than two-wheel. Yeah, it makes a big difference when those front wheels don't grip. So it was a matter of reversing and hitting it like hell because I didn't realise it was only in two-wheel drive. Plenty of power, of course, can get them up. But for a winter, it was quite a nice day. That's one good thing, of course. We get a very, very heavy frost in the morning, but we get a beautiful day afterwards, don't we? As long as you're home by four o'clock. It certainly gets cold but once that sun goes down. There's service for you. Good to see. Plenty of spectators on the bank. Uh, you're out in the sticks there, but once you be going backwards and forth a few times, I don't know, people just seem to appear. It's quite good from that point of view, because if you get in trouble, there's always someone to give you a push. All coming across, very, very straight line. Well, usually you go by the man in front. I happen to be in front at the moment. But if his Land Rover is going straight and not too bumpy and not going underwater too much, then everyone follows that one as well. Uh, you can go a couple of yards to one side and all of a sudden you just disappear. A yeah, matter of picking out the best line and the safest route, I suppose. That's right. No shortage of water, no shortage of boulders. Now that is actually basically our way out. We go over through those trees and out onto the main road now. Pretty quiet, isn't it? Uh, it's nice, it's peaceful. You've got the noise of the motor, but you've got no other well, city noises, town noise, everything else. You can breathe out there, it's terrific. We made it across there safely. Good, pure, clean water. Yeah, well, there's some nice trout in there too. I don't suppose you've picked up any of those while you've been driving through? Uh, no, we've never managed those up to now. Yes, please, Ronnie. <laughs> Everybody back and heading for home? Yeah. We finally called it a day. Everyone other than the Coke, we all wanted a cup of coffee as well. One can understand that. As you say, you get a bit cold after the event. You certainly need to warm up. A little bit of uh, fast talk going on before we go back, but uh, we disappear through the trees and everyone heads off in totally different directions home to a nice meal. Telling more lies. <laughs> 
be not a lot of places, a lot of places in the world that you can um, just go ten minutes down the road and get into something like that, is there? No, that is one of the beauties of Christchurch. do now is go right back to basically the beginning and the wall of death was this what really started you off on the speedway yeah well the wall of death started me off on motorbikes like the back i mean my old man built one in the backyard just as a hobby and <laughs> things were developed from there but once he built a big pro one and we we're traveling doing the shows we were over in perth in western australia i was too young to know at the time but he had two contracts one to go to South Africa, or one to come here to New Zealand. And he decided on New Zealand. So we headed back this way, and while he was going through Adelaide, he saw an old Speedway Rudge, and he bought it. So that came with us to New Zealand. Okay, we're doing circus shows right throughout New Zealand. In Adelaide, uh, sorry, in Wellington, there's Speedway and Bruce Abernathy. So my old man out there, <laughs> leg trailing on a rudge and he beat Abbo, the top man in New Zealand. So the wall of death sort of stopped for Saturday nights and Titus Speedway took over. Well I didn't know at the time either, I was still too young, but the directors of Wellington asked him would he build a speedway here in Christchurch. So we finished our show run, flew down here to Christchurch, Dad went out and had a look at the site out at Aranui and flew home to Tasmania, sold a house bought a house just up the road from where we are now and built the speedway. But of course he built the speedway, I'm there, well helping, counting the truckloads coming in, things like that. And I turned 15. Well in those days when you were 15 you could get your driving licence. Get your driving licence and get your competition licence. So speedway started, I started. Of course the, the particular speedway you would have been talking about would have been Aranui, one of the original speedways in Christchurch and the focal point I think of Saturday Night Entertainment especially for families. You got any fond memories of the old Aranui circuit? Yep. I mean, it was the first circuit, but it was tradition. It was cinders, dirty, nasty, and everything else. But also, it was a track that had grip, and you could make a bike really go on cinders. Mm -hmm. I love that. You used to get very, very big crowds there, didn't they? Well, there are certain nights there where they were actually sitting on the bar wall fence around the top of the, the main fence to get in. It was fantastic. Not the most comfortable position, mm. obviously. How much racing had you done before you moved to England? Two seasons there, anyway. Good seasons? Oh, yeah, very good seasons. Uh, from the point of view that I came on Dad's old rudge, then a local firm started building bikes. I didn't know at the time, but they just took a made a plan of, of a photograph of an English bike and built it, which wasn't right, but it was the ultimate, so I had one of those. And then Norman Parker came out here, and he had a second-hand star ride, and Dad bought it for me, and oh, that was the ultimate. So we bought the latest four-step uh, Jap, and oh, put that in, and things started to go, and I started to really go too. And that's when Norman Parker said, well, he didn't say to me, he said to Dad, England. So, went. Just going back a little, of course, uh, you were talking about your father there, and of course he was one of the well-known leg trailers. Something you never really did, leg trailing. No, it, it just didn't feel natural. I tried it, fell off, but it just didn't feel natural to me. I felt more natural in the natural position, which is foot forward in actual fact. Right. In your day, of course, when you were in England, there was huge crowds there, but now we hear of dwindling numbers over there, probably for various reasons. Do you put it down to any particular point? OK, well, obviously you've got the cost of living and everything else these days, but what I put it down to more than anything else, all the tracks in England now are slick as hell. Gator's paradise. Last time I was over there, you could have filled your programme in after the first corner. That was the result of that race. It was just so slick, there was no passing. They gotta go back, get dirt on the tracks, and then passing. I mean, I could go out on a motor that wasn't, well, was going, but it wasn't really terrific. But just on your riding ability, you could still win races because the grip was there and you could go. But these days, you just spin like hell all the way. 
Yeah, it's not good at all. Of course, obviously the public want to see as much passing and so forth as they can. I know over there that well, I've heard through some of the riders that have come over from England that officials in there have stopped uh, the riders doing anything like wheelies and all this sort of thing, which I think the public probably like and makes for more entertainment. Do you think that perhaps officialdom should be lightening up a little in that area? Yet all kind of things like that have been hit on the head. I mean, people love to see a guy charging down a full infrastructure doing with it. I used to be paid in the old days to do that in races, but I had to win, but to do it as well, you know. So it's all part of show business, it's part of speed money, it's part of life. Oh. It puts spectacular spots back into sport. Hey, Andy, you feel like coffee? Great idea. Shaney, yeah. can you give us a coffee, love? Yeah. That would be brilliant. Warm up the inner man. <laughs> Throughout your career, of course, do you prefer riding as part of a team in league racing or singularly in open meetings or again as, as part of a team, you know, racing for your country? Team, I prefer more than anything else. <sighs> well, as a team, you don't need to know you're a part of the team. It was so important. I mean, when I was at Wimbledon, and especially when I became captain of Wimbledon, to get the right atmosphere with all the guys and to help them, well, it just it was such a lovely feeling for that team to win. Not for you to win, for the team to win. That was really important as far as I was concerned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot to be said for that. It's something we don't see over here enough. Do you think there's ever any chance that we could get some sort of league racing going in this country? Well, way back in the 50s, we did have it. And every time, we'll just say Dunedin came up to Christchurch. They had a fantastic crowd at Christchurch. People loved it, to be able to back their own hometown. It's plain common sense. But New Zealand, well, with the number of tracks we got and the number of riders we got, I don't think we're ever going to get it. Yeah, obviously, the number of riders needs to be built up in this country, which is something we'll, we'll have a look at a little later on. Um, British fans, of course, where you were doing all your racing, is uh, said to be the most fanatical in the world and can be of a great help to a rider. And you had an enormous personal following. Do you think this is a great help to you when you're riding? Yes, definitely. I uh, well, see, you're riding, and you're going to make a living of it, aren't you? But you're riding for them. And because you're riding for them, they're yelling to you like looking mad, and they. Well, it just push you and encourage you on. The only thing was there was drawbacks at times on it. But, I mean, I fell off once and we were lost and the crowd blamed me. Hey, Phil. Shani, thank you very much, Shani. Yeah, the, the supporters actually blame me for losing the match because I fell off and lost three points. <laughs> That's just the other side of things. A hero one minute and down the tube the next. That's it. Yeah. Do you have a fan club over there? Yeah. Basically there again, that is something that just a very good fan organises and it just grows and grows and grows. I don't know how many finished up in it, but it was thousands in the end. Well, when I had my bang, I didn't know this at the time, but straight away they started organising raffles, dances, all kinds of things to collect money, to fly me back to England just to see me walking, which they done. And that was a few thousand quid later. It would be. That was fans. Bring a tear to your eye? Yeah. Yeah, no, good thing too. They're still all there too, of course, aren't they, those fans? Yeah. yeah. You'll be looking forward to seeing them again sometime. In your early days, of course, you raced as part of the Australian team and then New Zealand. How did that come about? <laughs> well, that was... Well, it got quite comical in the end. I was born in Tasmania, so... Fundamentally, I'm an Australian. So when I went to England, and after a year, so I got going. Well, then I was New Zealand didn't have a team actually. In those days. I was picked for the Australian team. So it was gold. A little bit later, I was captain the Australian team. Still a good goal. But then Trevor Redman, he was an organizer, if ever there was one. He organized a New Zealand team. Only a minor team for. Not official test matches, but test, well, sort of New Zealand versus Bradford, New Zealand versus so on, so forth. Little tracks like that all around the country. But that grew. And it grew at the state of that, well, in New Zealand, was fielding a test team. And so I was riding in the Australian tests, and I was riding in the New Zealand tests. Well, that was a bit naughty, but as long as I was being picked, I didn't mind. But then, of course, the control board finally stepped in. 
And they said, what the hell are you? Bloody New Zealander or Australian? I thought I got a New Zealand passport. I live in New Zealand. I'm New Zealand. That's it. That's the thing. Australia's loss was certainly New Zealand's game. We're only too happy that it worked out that way, that's for sure. You won two World Individual titles. How were those meetings different from all the others, like league matches and that type of thing? Oh, uh, to me, they weren't. Maybe that was my trouble. I treated a World Final with just another meeting. OK, you've, you've done your motor up, naturally, but that was it. Yeah. You won it, you won it. If you didn't, it wasn't the end of the world. It was is another meeting, so what the hell? You, I mean, people used to get screwed up tight, shaking like a leaf in a mouth because they were in the world final. But that was stupid. It's just another meeting. Yeah, no real glorious moments for you, though. I mean, there must have been... Oh, well, the adrenaline must have been pumping up just that much more. Yeah, well, I mean, the very first one in 54, I'd broken my leg in five places in Denmark a couple of months beforehand, so... I've got a steel brace on my leg and everything else, but that, in terms, was a help, I think. Because though I don't fundamentally get nervous, you still get screwed up tight, naturally. And because of my leg and my brace and everything else, I'm not hoping bloody hell, so, not. so I go. And at practice, Freddie Williams came up to me. He said, you're going to win this final. I said, oh, of course. Why? He said, I'm clocking everyone. He said, you're going to win. He said, you're second faster to this point than anyone else. I said, oh, rats. But the final itself, I still thought, no chance, because of my leg and hell. And I don't usually make good starts. I made four lovely starts. One I missed, but I came through and won it. So that in itself was terrific. But in those days, there was no sponsorship or anything like that. So you just got the bare prize money. And that was it. So, it's still just another meeting, really. Right, yeah. And getting on to the, the motors, of course, that have been used, because you were very, very uh, popular with the Jap. Then, of course, came the Jawas and the Weslakes and so forth. Have you, have you noticed uh, anything different with these motors? Like, is any one better than the other? Yeah, well, they are, but it depends totally on the rider. Certain motors suit certain riders. I get to hop on a Weslake, but they don't blend. It just doesn't blend with it. They don't like it. And they hop onto a garden, and all of a sudden, they go, or vice versa, you know. But with the four valves, you've got more torque and pull off the gate and out the corners. But that's where, if they had the grip, then it would be fantastic. Mm. What about frames? Uh, I mean, we seem see various frames. We see them from backyard built jobs up to the professionally built jobs. Here again, is there any particular difference? And, and you know, is there any particular one that people should look for? Not now. Back in the old days, yes, there was such a variation of frames. But now, fundamentally, it's a Java frame, or someone has copied a Java frame, done a slight little mod, but fundamentally, they're all Java frames, with that loopy back end, which is the down point on all Speedway bikes. It'll slide through a corner as easy as hell. You don't have to make it go through a corner, but it's not getting the grip. The old back ends, you had to make it turn the corner, but you <laughs> went like that. Moving from the two-wheel to the four-wheel, you, you moved away from Speedway for a couple of years and got into racing cars. How did you enjoy that? I really loved it. I really and truly loved it. I started off just loosely and then I went, no, I'm going to go serious on this. But I had to buy my own cars naturally, so that was costing. So I didn't have the very latest. But I did one complete season, went out and won all the races in Africa, came back and went right through Europe and was up in the first three all the time in my races. Uh, people started to look a little bit. The second year started again, I was sold those cars and got another second hand car, but a later model one and so on and so forth. It went on. And I had an offer from two firms for the coming winter to go to Silverstone and just have a little trial in their cars to see if I was adaptable and suitable. Well, the chances were I could have become a works driver. But at the time, my wife was in hospital with twins, she was really bad, and she put it on me to quit cars. And I said, why? She said, well, this year, five of your friends have got killed. You know, Speedway, you've broken your legs, and I hate it when you break your leg, but at least you're here, you're not dead. Will you quit cars? So to please her, I quit. I understand, Ronnie, that recently you had the opportunity once more to climb into a race car. 
yeah, it was a, another one of these the all Sunday afternoon outings. But it was a freezing cold Sunday. But it was such an opportunity to hop into one that I had to go. And boy, it was a dream. Admittedly, I couldn't feel my fingers or anything else to start off with, but once I got into that car, oh, it was wonderful. What sort of car was it? Formula Ford. 1600cc, but plenty of power. Oh, God. The power on the wet track was out of this world. I spun up three times in uh, two laps, uh, going a little bit mad to start off with, still getting the feel of it, and I was stretching a little bit to reach the controls. That was a trouble. Good to hear an honest race driver. <laughs> I understand this was a classic car day. Yep, there was a, a little bit of everything there. And uh, in actual fact, two of them, I didn't realise at the time until afterwards when they told me, I went to school with these fellas as well. And it was a really terrific reunion. A very small world in racing circles, isn't it? Very, very small. But you can make one hell of a lot of friends in this side of things too. And through it, you get a lot of benefits for your own normal life, never mind about the car racing side of it. Was this the first time that you'd actually been in a Formula Ford? Yep. It, I'd been in uh, things similar, but never, I haven't been in a racing car for donkey's years. And boy, when I got into that, oh, the feeling was out of this world. Good to see that there's so many safety requirements for these cars. Yep, well, in my days, no one wore a seatbelt to start off with, which was stupid, but that was just the current trend, and that's what the people did. Now, of course, you've got to be so strict on all this, which is a very good thing. Any pre-race nerves? <laughs> no, not in this, because I wasn't really revving it. I mean, I borrowed the car, so I couldn't go and blow the blink thing up. So uh, I, I just sort of went steady and gently and didn't over-rev it. In fact, didn't even take it up to peak revs, just so that uh, nothing would happen to it. This is at Royal Furna Park at the Canterbury Car Club circuit, which is right next door to Royal Furna Park Speedway. Quite a good sort of track to run on. Yes, it's a very good, interesting, but uh, I am at the present moment planning to add another three quarters of a mile onto it to make it a full Grand Prix circuit, which will be good. I think we might even see a Ronnie Moore coming out into a Formula One rule. <laughs> I very much doubt it. Uh, as far as money wise and all the rest of it, it's way, way off. Very interesting collection of cars here, very old. Oh, some of them are real classic. And it's surprising how potent some of those things are, too. What sort of position did you manage to get into in this particular run? Or were you just idling around the back of the field? Uh, no, actual fact, we had a couple of runs, and the first one I was off the front of the grid, and I sort of just went and left everything. So they made me go off the back of the field in the next one. It all came through okay until I got a little flat. I had to pull out, and we discovered a nail in the tire. How the nail got there, I'm damned if I know. Obviously some of the opposition throwing them out in front of you. <laughs> uh, I don't think they were getting that naughty. Your raceways have um, become very popular in this country, and the big sedans and everything else, but there's still room for a lot of the classic cars. There's quite a few of them around New Zealand. Oh, yes, it uh, really, I think they're one heck of a lot of overseas drivers now in these type of classes coming over as well, which is good. Fair amount of wheel spin with the wet conditions. <laughs> Put your foot down and you spun like hell. It was a matter of easing everything. You don't seem to have uh, raised much of a sweat the whole day. <laughs> no, but it was a tight fit getting in and out of that. Obviously easier to get into than getting out of. Yeah, I was really annoyed on that puncture because I was just really getting into the swing of things and then had to stop and of course, as it was just a fun day, he didn't have a spare wheel or anything with him.
didn't have any trouble sort of sorting out all the gears and so forth, quite a bit different from the um, days of uh, long ago. No, basic everything was okay there, I was just stretching a little bit to reach the controls, which was uh, annoying because I had to slip down into the car a bit to get the clutch and brake and then sort of get my head back up again to the corner. Of course, obviously it's not uh, Formula One teams here because usually the driver doesn't have to help putting the car on the trailer. <laughs> No, but I mean, after all, borrowing his car, at least you have to do is help him get it back onto the trailer. And like every other thing, then you go and do on a Sunday afternoon, there's another round of uh, telling lies and sorting out what you should have done and what you didn't do. Yeah, but it was a mighty fine day. A smile from ear to ear. Do you feel that <clears throat> had you had further opportunity in cars that you would have done well in it? I'm convinced I would have, but also all my friends of those days that came up right through the top, well, in fact a lot of them became world champions, and they're all dead. So there's two ways of looking yeah, at all these things. Absolutely right. Yeah. There's been a lot of deaths and so forth, of course, in the speedway even. And I suppose it's something that's to do with the speed of the sport. Have you lost a lot of your friends through injuries and um, death in Speedway? Yeah, not permanent. I mean, there have been a couple that have been paralysed. That is murder. And Ernie Rossio, the American road for one man, he got killed, and that's the way back early. And boy, that really hit me, that one, because I used to stay at Ernie's on the way back to England each year. So he was a real personal friend. And it does hit you, but... Oh, You've got to accept it. it's also a speedway and a part of life. If you hadn't taken those two years with the cars and carried on speedway, do you think you would have picked up more than the, the two world titles that you got? Mm, well, it's possible. I mean, I won in 54, I was second the next two years, missed it by one point. Okay, so I shoot off for two years and do car racing. I come back, 59, I won it again. And in 60, London, Crave and myself tied on 14 points for a runoff. Obi won it and I was second. So, well, over that period of time, I was first or second all the time, so well, there's a chance I could have. When you went to England, was money the attraction or was it the challenge to, to make it to the top and get a world championship? Well, I fundamentally was too young to think money that much. No, it was a, a challenge. I mean, here, New Zealand Speedway is kindergarten, going to high school when you go to England. And it was a challenge to see if I could do it. Because here in New Zealand you're riding on the one track all the time. In England, all different shapes, sizes, surfaces, everything and it was a challenge. Even now when Speedway fans think of running more, they think of Wimbledon. What was it that made you stay with the team for most of your career? <sighs> Two things. First, they gave me the break when I went over to England. So I was in. And secondly, it was the team. Uh, we just built up a team. And I just couldn't leave that team. I was offered. I was offered fantastic money to apply for transfer from different other providers, but I was happy at one moment. I didn't want to leave. Well, Shani went to a lot of trouble to get you a cup of coffee, and you haven't had a chance to drink it yet, so we might as well have a coffee break right here. Definitely. <laughs> well, that's lubricated the tonsils a bit, Ronnie. You feel a bit, bit more relaxed now, eh? <laughs> Get it for the throat, isn't it? It must be really sad for you, you know, we're talking about Win Wimbledon here, that Wimbledon's play lane is to close down after all those great years. Is this a sign of the times or just pressure from other elements? Well, I think it's more just the times, shortage of money, this, that, everything else. But Wimbledon, as far as I can turn, is the ultimate stadium in London for all speedway, as far as the facilities are concerned for the crowd and everything else, but it was also GRA and the rent they wanted for that was just too high. And the crowds they were getting against the rent they had to pay, they just had to close it. Put some dirt back on the track and put some bloody racing and they might have got good crowds again. That seems to be the problem all over, doesn't it? You're talking about facilities at Wimbledon. This is something that we lack in New Zealand. Okay, we have stadiums all out in the open. Do you think New Zealand should perhaps be looking at the likes of putting in restaurants and, and a bar and all that sort of thing to get the whole crowd back? 
Well, it would help. I mean, people are paying to go through those turnstiles and watch Speedway. But to have all the other facilities there is a great help, definitely. Mm, I've always said that um, I think New Zealanders' drinking habits and all that sort of thing have changed. And I think now when they go out for a night of entertainment, they expect to be able to get a drink and a meal rather yep. than a bag of chips and a hot dog. Definitely. Right. That's something we all agree on. Before you made it to the top, was it hard to become accepted by the top group of writers in England, sometimes referred to as the clan? Yeah. Well, when I arrived, because I knew nothing about this clan. And I'd ask Norman, well, how do I ride this track? And Norman would say, flat. I didn't realise that after this, what he told me to do on every bloody track, flat, <laughs> which was impossible. But so I would go flat. Well, one of the clan would be ahead of me going into the corner, but he'd shut off for the corner. And I wouldn't shut off for the corner. And I'd be in under him and hit him, <laughs> you know. Well, sometimes I knocked him off too, but mostly I just hit him until I bounced off him. Then one night at New Cross, we were sitting on a stool by the track while the racing was going on. Norman Parker's one side of me, and Jack Parker is on the other side of me. Now, Jack is the head of the clan. He leans across in front of me and says to Norm, but so I can hear it, tell your boy to slow down or he's going to get hurt. And Norm said, why? He said, well, he's hitting too many of us. And then everybody just carry on as normal. Well, one certain rider that rode for Wembley had had me over the fence three times and had me off a couple of times. He was a member of the clan. And then one night I got him and I put him across the grass at Wembley. Well, it's a taboo to walk on that grass at Wembley. Never mind putting a bloody speedway bike across and doing a big slide. Boy, was he in trouble. And afterwards he came up to me and said, well, look, uh, are we quits now? I said, well, you've had me six times, I've only had you once. He said, yeah, but if I don't ever do it to you anymore, will you, you won't do it to me? I said, no. Well, I didn't know, but that night I was accepted into that clan. And I was told then as well. So those particular riders especially, uh, I've still passed, but I'll make sure I didn't touch them when I passed them. Yeah, fair enough too. We all know that on the track, of course, it is every man for himself, but do you think there's any riders that you raced with that took it a little too far? Oh yeah, there was three or four of them like that. They had a name. But by then, of course, I was going, so I just had words with them too. Don't do it to me, I won't do it to you. It was accepted. There was a lot of a lot of tracks in England when you were over there, nowhere near as many now. But did they all have different features to them? Oh yes, every track was totally different. I mean, a lot of the tracks were built in a particular stadium, but that stadium had a dog track, greyhound track on it. So the speedway track has got to go fundamentally the shape of that dog track, it's into it. that conforms the shape of it. And there were different sizes, different shapes, different surfaces, different everything. And that was what taught you Speedway. Every night you were riding on a totally different track, which was good. You, of course, naturally would um, say that Wimbledon was your favourite track because you were there most of the time. But were there any other favourite tracks that you raced on? Yeah. In actual fact, a track I preferred to race on against Wimbledon was our next door neighbour, Hackney. It was a nicer shape. I loved it. And of course, Wembley? Wembley, the track in itself was just so bad, but of course the atmosphere at Wembley was just out of this world. Even a guy that wasn't very good, he just got the feeling at Wembley and he'd go harder than he'd ever gone in his life, just because he's actually on, well, basically it was just about sacred soil. When you got into the league racing, obviously you had to build your way up. How did you manage to get up the ladder into team leader? Well, when I first started, well, I went over and I did a trial, and there I arrived the day they were having their first practice before the season started. And Mike Erskine was one of the Wimbledon members, and Mike also used to produce speedway bikes in those days. So Norman Parker borrowed the bike off Mike. I said, that's my, my usual thing, how do I ride it? He said, flat. I did manage two laps before I hit the fence, over the top of the fence and finished up on the dog track. And bent my bike too. <laughs> but that made Ronnie Green, who was promoter at Wimbledon, look 
I knew nothing about this at the time. My father's there, and negotiations started on the side for Wimbledon as reserve. Okay, that's where it's going. But after about a month, I was into the team, and one of the guys was out of the team as reserve. And then it just sort of crept on, and I just kept going better and better and better, and became a heat leader who gold, and then a couple of years later I was captain. In the league racing, who did you enjoy team riding like with your own team? Who did you enjoy team riding with the most? Uh, my namesake, Peter Moore, in actual fact. Well, it was two of them, but Peter Moore was, he was a terrific gator. So I didn't have to worry about my partner as far as gating. Nine times out of ten, he'd beat me off the start anyway. But we got a little understanding, and I told him what I wanted him to do, and he would do it. And he would leave a three-foot gap off the line for me. And I would nose into that once I got through. But let him go into the corner first every time. But as long as I had that little gap so that I could move her and cover him. And it worked. We used to one hell of a lot of five ones that way. With all the riding you've done, of course, it was probably very difficult to pull this one out. But in open meetings, who did you consider to be your most respected rival? Well, for consistency in those days, Ovi Thunden. Ovi was a hard man to ride against. He was another one that was really hard out on the track. But perfect friends, as soon as the meeting finished, any time I went to Sweden, I would stay with him. When he came out to New Zealand, he'd stay with me. In fact, the other day, he phoned me. And he said, uh, they do parachute jumping out there? I said, yep. Yeah. Only about six guys got killed this week. You know, don't be surprised they knock at the door shortly. I might be arriving. I said, okay, see you when you get here. Just like that. Hey, we all look forward to that. <laughs> Give me a ring. When you first started riding at Wimbledon, you, you found the track to be smaller than you were used to, obviously, out to New Zealand standards. Does this present any problems to you? Uh, it did to start off with, because coming from big quarter milers on to little ones, you've got to turn a lot tighter and actually. But because I love foot forward and really and truly foot forward, as long as you were well and truly forward on the bike, the back end would break away and you could get around the corner. And I sort of got a little tradition of a white liner and everyone knew I was a white liner. I never used to move off the line. One night, Anders Michinek he was standing there at Wimbledon and he said, I found your secret here. I said, what's that? He said, that bit of dirt you ride on, no one else is riding on. So I left that, but he's in the next race with me. And he makes a start and he goes on my bit of dirt. And I had to do some fast thinking on that one. But I thought, psycho, but you can do, you can psycho riders out of things. So all I kept doing for three and a half laps was poking the wheel in underneath him all the time. And on the last corner, he really clamped down on my bit of dirt, but I wasn't there. I went straight round the outside of him. <laughs> he cursed me after the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, you went from a New Zealand track, which basically in those days used to be around about the 400, 440 yard. You went to a smaller track in England. You've also raced in America on what we call the saucer tracks. How different is that? I love it. It's really fantastic. First time... I went in, I was going back to England for New Zealand World Team Cup because I'd finished Speedway. And Harry Oxley wanted me to call in to Los Angeles on the way home. So I said, okay, I'll step in and do a meeting. So I arrived and I'm riding that night. They supplied me with a new bike and everything else. So I go to the track and I thought, black in hell, they're kidding. This is Cycle Speedway, not Speedway. I said, I can have a practice. I said, no, the meeting started short, no practice. My first meeting, I got a series of match races against Mike Bass, the American champion. Oh, God, this is going to be terrific. But, no, it did. It felt terrific. I loved it. Little tight ones, you really had to turn to get round. And I, I like it. So I finished up saying there two weeks, right, and every night of the week. But then I had to get back here to my business, so I left and I said, oh, it's really good. How many different tracks did you race in, on, in America? Five. Five? Yeah. Each night of the week, bang, 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 and then back and down another week. There were tracks, a lot more tracks, but this was all, all within 150 mile radius of LA, and that's all I was had time for. I remember you telling me earlier about visa problems in America. How did you get around that? Well, once, well, this actual time, I didn't have a visa when I called in, so I was going to do one, two meetings, and then, oh, 
And they kept pushing me to stay and stay and stay. So I said, these, I've got no visa, I've got to go. So they said, well, you can hop down to Mexico and get a visa. And Harry said, hang on a minute, I'm going to phone the embassy down there. Well, there was a little bit of trouble and strife in Mexico at the time. And he said, don't come down here, you won't get back out. So Harry says, Canada. So I hopped on a plane, flew up to Canada, saw the ambassador there. They gave me a visa, come back. So I stayed another week and <laughs> done more meetings. This was getting obviously near the end of your career. <clears throat> Can we take a brief look at, at the, that sad day in Newcastle, Australia, where you had that terrible crash which would end your career and nearly your life? How do you feel that it all ended that way? Uh, I was screwed up tight on it. I mean, once I became normal again, I got my centres back, which was quite a few months. Because basically I was, had planned on retiring the end of that season, I was going to call it quits. But the previous year when I'd been in America, I was offered such a fantastic contract to go back there, take my family and everything else for three months, and that's what I was going to do. And that bang, wiped all that, and I was really screwed up tight on that one. You were sort of stuck in hospital for a long, long time. What were your feelings then that, you know, that it all ended, what were you going to do next? I got to the stage where I was ready to put my head through a window. I wasn't that mental, and I knew what I was thinking, but I was screwed up tight. And I had nine months flat on my back, with nothing to do but think. And I thought about too many things in actual fact, which was pretty hard. But then things started to level out and bang, bang, bang. So once I sort of became fundamentally normal again. Well then, I just went back to the motorbike shop. Injuries, of course, they're taken for granted as being part of racing. Have there been times that you've raced while still suffering from a previous injury? Oh yeah, plenty of times. Nothing. In fact, the insurance company in England loved me because they knew I was never pulling any strings. Well, well, first time I won the world final, my leg broke me in five places. Two years, the Danish hospital said. Well, I got carried down the fire escape two days after it happened, flown back to England, a New Zealand surgeon tore the plaster off, made up the steel brace, took my crutches away and said, start walking. And you're kidding, he said, no you're not, you're going to start walking if you're going to ride again. So I started walking and a few months later I went to a final. <laughs> Collarbones, things like that, they have things that happen all the time. All you do is put a figure eight brace with a bandage on you, pull them back, you go out and ride again, that's nothing. Simple. Good attitude. As you've said in the past, money wasn't everything to you, so long as the bills are being paid and you're enjoying your life. I know that you even found time to learn to fly, and really loved aerobatics. What type of plane did you to learn to fly in? Oh, a dream. Tiger Moss. Back in 1953, Johannesburg. Uh, the weather out there, of course, was terrific, so I had a, a pair of shorts and a goggles, and that was it and learnt, I went solo and then learnt in a tiger moth and it was out of this world. Since then I've got ratings on a lot of other different things. In fact, I've been up in the front and flown 747s and everything else. I mean, you shouldn't say all these things, but I have a lot of passenger aircraft. I've finished up up the front. But a tiger moth, as far as I'm concerned, was the ultimate. And the other day, about a week ago, I was asked uh, by a friend of mine, would I like to have a little stint round? So I shot out there. And aerobatics is something I love, and a tiger moth, ooh, they are lovely. I mean, there's modern planes really built for aerobatics these days, but the old tiger was limited to so much before the wings folded off and things like that, but all oh, the things you could do with it without this world. I really enjoy that. You really enjoyed that day out? Oh, terrific. Well, that certainly isn't a tiger moth. What sort of um, unit is that one, Ronnie? <laughs> that? Well, basically, it's a home built special micro light. Uh, it's fantastic little things, they are, in actual fact. I'd love to have a go on one of them, too, but uh, at the moment, I haven't been able to borrow one. 
Here we have uh, Baron Von Moore kitting up, ready for the uh, big event. Well, we're still in the middle of winter, and when you get up there, it can get cool. So it pays to be covered up a little bit before you get up there. Here we have one beautiful looking plane. What sort of age are we looking at here? I don't really know. But I mean, they were, oh, most of them were pre-war. But they're fantastic. To have one like that now costs one hell of a lot of money to keep it maintained, the CLA and everything else. So it's up to scratch. But oh, they're basically, they're worth their weight in gold now, Tiger Moths. You certainly don't see many around. See the number 46 on the front, has that got any relevance to anything? Not as far as I know, but uh, I didn't actually ask him. And who's the proud owner of this machine? Yes, yeah, Simon. Actual fact, he's going to fly that Tiger Moth to England via Russia very shortly. Be one exciting trip. Uh, I have sort of been asked, would I like to go on a trip? It would be fantastic. But 12,000 mile at 85 mile an hour uh, <laughs> would be a little bit slow, I think. Especially uh, compared to today's uh, aircraft. Oh, they are mighty aircraft. I mean, these days, for people to look at, they may be nothing much to look at. But, oh, I glow when I see planes like that. Certainly know your way around the engines of the Tiger Moth too, do you? Yeah. Basically, because I learnt on the Tiger Moth, the first plane I ever flown, that you had to know. And once you start on something like that, it's a thing, well, even 40 years later, you just don't forget. There's certain little routines you get into, and you stick to those routines. What a solid plane, aren't they? They're, they're quite solid, especially for the, the time in which they were built. They're a good solid plane. I mean, they can bounce like hell when you hit the ground sometimes, but they still stay in one piece. Actually, even the uh, the lines are still very, very aerodynamic, aren't they? Yeah. Even when you look at today's aircraft. Well, for two, about two years ago, the Junior Speedway School shouted me a Christmas present, and it was in this plane, fly back over the school and drop a load of sweets all over the track. And when I met Simon that time, I said, well, I'm going to be back one day, and here I am back, not for lollies, but to do a little stunts. Half an inch forward, okay? And you can control the, you know, if it's yeah. moving too fast, you can just put it back a bit. Are you happy with that? Yeah. He found the best place to taxi off from and get into the best wind area. Yeah, well, I mean, it's only a grass strip. <coughs> but it was suddenly blowing that day, so we just headed straight up into it, which was lovely. But for winter, it was a lovely, clear day. No clouds, which is perfect for stunts. The cameraman there was uh, very steady with the hand when the plane got a bit close to him. Well, we had to come down so Kelvin could get a good shot after that, that's all. I understand he was offered a ride with, uh, in the plane, but chickened out. Well, I was going to take the camera up with me when we'd done some loops, but it was a little bit too big to hold, so uh, we missed that bit. But it would have been interesting to have the camera up there with us. favourite part of aerobatics. This is a wonderful feeling. It is a really wonderful feeling when you're doing this. 
What are you actually feeling when you know the, the motor, the revs drop right away and it's just peace, quiet, nothing else? Oh, it's hard to describe the feeling. I mean, you go into the loop and you've got weightlessness anyway. You've got your safety stress, but they're not doing a thing because you don't need it. The CAG is holding you there. And then they go into the spin like that and see the earth spinning away and you're coming down at it. Oh, it's a wonderful sensation. Really terrific. You had a great sensation to hear the revs build up again too before you get too close oh, yeah. around. <laughs> you have to get back up again. But that, that's no problem. Just a pity we couldn't find another one. We could have had a couple of dog fights up there. Uh, it would be interesting. be very interesting. There is another one, but it's up the North Island. It's a little bit too far to bring down. Yeah, so I suppose the freezing level wouldn't be uh, that high either at this time of year, would it? Not at this time of the year. You could feel it up there. Just so Kelvin could get another good shot. Do you get uh, to do much in the way of the uh, handling of it, like you're doing a bit of work in the back there? Yeah. Uh, the controls were all set up in the back and got up the handle feel and Simon he knew me, so, so that we couldn't really speak to each other, not in the tiger mod, but just little hand signals, and so things sort of progressed. And as we were saying about the freezing level, it certainly would be cold up there, that's obviously why you've got those big thick jackets. It wasn't cold while you were up there. Afterwards, when I got down on the ground, I felt a bit, but up there you didn't feel the thing. Mind on other things. It's very difficult to land. No, they're a dream to land. They're so big. The sides have been bang and down. They're lovely. They are like a Model T Ford, and I can think. That's how they're going to go. They're fantastic. They'll never ever be replaced. Easy to pick out, aren't they, with that uh, wing design? Yeah. Basically, I mean. You can if you've got real severe with them, just to tear the wings off on a poor old tire you might. But the things you can do with them, and they flex but still carry on, and all you've got to think of is the age of them. That sort of makes you think a little bit at times, but no real problems. Safety back on the ground. A bit easier to get out of than race cars. <laughs> a lot easier to get out. No problems walking on terra firma again? Oh no, and it, no, that never affected me at all. It's, it's just such a, a lovely feeling. But even though you get back on ground, you're still floating because you, you're still up there. You want to go again? <laughs> right, more days like this. Because tyres amongst other things are very expensive these days and I suppose with extra wheel spin you're not doing the engine that much good either. A lot more expense. All expense. Admittedly, these days you're getting one hell of a lot more prize money as well to go back to the old days. But the four valve motors especially every now and again boom and boy the expense there is out of this world. Did you go through a lot of motors when you were racing? No. I dropped one valve in 20 years of racing. Basically because I had a golden rule. Each valve would only do four meetings, was out and new valves in. It was insurance, but insurance that was only costing me basically about 10 more shillings in those days a meeting. Mm. So I never blew motors. Maintenance is obviously a very big thing. Very big thing. I never like to do more than two meetings maximum without stripping my motor and rebuilding it again. As long as you had the time, sometimes you just couldn't. I mean, once I did 13 meetings in 14 days in three different countries, well, there it was a matter of putting spare motors in all the time. But then when I finally got a break, every one of those motors was completely stripped and rebuilt again too. You started your career very young. How hard is it now for a young rider to break in and make it overseas? <sighs> it's real damn hard. They've got, when they go, well, they've got to have the ability, naturally, but 
they're going to go and be prepared to well, just battle for a couple of years and there's only two seasons before they're going to start to click as far as English racing is concerned especially and blend in and start to get going. You've got to well, be patient. Over the years more and more riders from Europe have been making it into the British League racing. Does this make it more difficult for young Kiwis like being so far away from England to get a place in the leagues? Definitely. <coughs> I mean, because you're 12,000 miles away from home to start off with, it's a big drawback. That hits you in the gut straight away. And Europe, there's so many riders there and they're just picking the best of them in, which is just making the standard higher and higher, actually. So it's one hell of a job for you to break in as far as England's concerned these days. All the riders like you raced with, many riders from Czechoslovakia, from Poland, from Russia, from Sweden, any that really stood out, any particular country that really worked hard on getting their riders up? Yep. Sweden did, and Sweden went through a cycle. Sweden went that way. Denmark came up. Denmark dominated. In fact, I find many still just about dominating at this very moment. But Sweden is now starting to creep back up again. It's Germany, Poland, Russia, and all they produce riders, but only the odd ones. Sweden and Denmark are producing teams, and they have got schools, and that is what makes it. Yeah, that's what's going to make New Zealand again too. We'll get onto that a little later. You've raced, obviously we've spoken about racing in New Zealand, in England, in America. What about in Europe? Did you do a lot of tracks around Europe? Oh yes, quite a lot of tracks. Uh, I never ever did that much. I went mean, over done meetings, mm -hmm. but not like other people. They were over there nearly every weekend racing. I was just so busy in England that I had to get have a, a little break. So it was sort of like Sundays off if possible. So I'd go over and I'd do meetings, but not a great deal. Obviously international experience for young riders is what gives them a competitive edge. And in the past we've had the British Lions, amongst others, touring New Zealand. What do you think we have to do in this country to get these very nece necessary internationals back once again? It's plain, simple, makes a fact. Money. Dollars. Dollars. They <coughs> like coming up, the English boys like coming up here because they're missing an English winter to start off with. In fact, the sun more directly. And especially in Christchurch, they like the atmosphere and everything else. A lot of the guys that have been out here, they ask to come back the next year as well. So there's no real problem, I think, in getting English guys out here. But it's just the financial part of it, of getting them, their bike, coming out here, and then racing just one night a week here against four or five in England, and then back to England again for the coming season. All adds up to money. Sponsorship in England, of course, seems to be very strong in Speedway, but over here it's, it's lacking badly. What do you think we need to do to, to build up the sponsorship for solo racing in this country? I think it's got to be someone, PRO, and really get stuck into it and work on it. I mean, an individual rider can go and see different firms, and some of them have, and some of them come up with a sponsorship. But you've got to have someone that's really and truly pushing it to, to get it. I'd hate to do the job. When you've got a good sponsorship, how important is it that you work in with the company that you've got sponsorship from? That's so important, that isn't true. They are backing you, they are really and truly backing you, and they're investing in you. So you've got to basically invest in that company and do everything you can for that company as well. That's really important, that is. And do you think a lot of young riders today let themselves down by not going back to the company that they've been dealing with? Um, supplying them with a photo, a letter of thanks, anything like that? Definitely. See, what, well, young riders especially, they're starting, and then they start to become good. Okay, that's good. But because they start to become good, they start to become big-headed. That is taboo. But it's natural. They've been struggling and they start to go good, so everything starts to spread out, instead of using this grey matter up here. Right, too. I think a lot of young people, ones I've uh, watched over the years, um, they're sort of starting to see now that they've got to, to work in and do a bit of public relations and so forth. Yeah. It's obviously very, very important, especially in New Zealand, to have that money behind you because things are a little more expensive here. How do you find, I mean, obviously you do a lot of work with bikes and so forth, how expensive are the parts here like compared to overseas? You need a gold mine here in New Zealand to get the bits that they can get, well, the bits. 
And every now and again, the New Zealand boy comes back and he brings spares with him, naturally. So he's going to have those spares and hold those spares all through this coming season. But then when he hops on a plane to fly back to England, those spares are up for sale. That is at the end of the season. So someone's going to buy them and build up their bike for the next season. But that's it. Six months behind or a year behind all the time. That's, that's no good. New Zealand, of course, has supplied <coughs> three world champions, yourself, I have Major Barry Briggs. But we've never really had a world competition here. Can you ever see any time in the future that we may get like a world teams or a world best peers over here? No. Basically, because of population. We just haven't got the population where you're working on the percentage of the population that are going to go and see that meeting. Our population just ain't big enough. Which is a real shame. Perhaps we need to get a few more immigrants in. Do you think that in the future, <clears throat> like in New Zealand, we talked about the British Lions, had the Americans here. Do you think that we can really get these teams back here? We seem to get the individuals, but never the teams. It's possible, but there again, it's just working on the numbers. We haven't got the real numbers to, to get a real good solid one. It could be done through training schools and things like that, and really, well, it needs someone pro behind it to push all this together. Otherwise, it's, people talk about it, but nothing's ever going to blink and happen. A lot of your time today, of course, is taken up in training Kiwi youngsters to ride speedway. Do you use the local Rua Puna Park speedway track, or do you have your own setup? No, I've got uh, a track 25 mile out of Christchurch and Kirwi, thanks to a very understanding farmer. Well, ten years ago now, he said, well, you can use that paddock. So we just put some tyres down, marked out a circuit, and bang, we started on that paddock. And then he'd come along and said, well, look, I want to use this paddock this year. Uh, you better go over to that paddock. So up with the tyres and over to that paddock, which was a lovely bumpy paddock. And this went on for a couple of years like that. And then I just said to him, I said, Barry, I said, how about that paddock? He said, that's me good paddock. Said, yeah, but... It's smooth, it's nice. He said, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. I said, yeah, but how about we bring the bulldozers in there? He said, turn the track? I said, yeah. He said, oh, what the hell? Okay. <laughs> so we got the graders in, we surveyed it, marked it all out, and laid a proper track. Dug right down, put a proper foundation, a pucker speedway track. Then at the local pub out of Kirby, that was our clubhouse. Uh, just sort of casual mention to all the farmers, uh, we need a truck. And one of the farmers said, well, i got one I'm not really using. You could have it for $200. I said, this is Junior Speedway. He said, oh, $50. I said, OK, we'll, we'll have that truck. So we got that truck. The next time someone supplied us with a big tank, and we picked it all up, and we had a water cart. And just through asking people, we've got a tractor, we've got a grader, We've got electric starting gates, we've got everything. And that is for them just to see kids be taught right from the word yo in actual fact. That's what it boils down to and that's what they've done. And a lot of them just come to watch every now and then and they get great pleasure out of it too. This track is named after a well known speedway rider. What's the place called? Uh, I think it is there, because fact, more park. More yeah. park. Well, yeah. Sort of like that, shouldn't have we? When one of your riders is starting to make the grade, can you often see yourself in that rider? Yeah. That's the trouble. I've got three of them that have got my style, everything. And though I shouldn't, I sort of work on those a little bit harder. Those three, too, because I can see myself in them, and it, it gives me one hell of a, a pleasure to see it, too. New Zealand certainly needs another world champion, so obviously you're the guy to um, push them through. The fact that you enjoyed yourself with the money you made from Speedway, what do you advise your young riders that decide to start a career on Speedway overseas? Well, firstly, if they are serving an apprenticeship here for a trade, they finish that apprenticeship first before they ever go to England. So they have got their ticket in a trade. Because, OK, you can go to England, you can be good, be the tops, but you can only go so many years and then you're finished speedway, so you've got to have a trade to fall back onto. Okay, you start making money, you start becoming good. Well, I enjoyed life, but I also invested money. So 
so that I had a house and everything else to come back to when I finished and that is important. You've got to look ahead long term or even from the point of view you can have a nasty accident and it's going to finish you in speedway. Right. So you just can't go and blow your money all like that. You've got to hang on to something to invest so that you've got something to fall back onto in case you have a bad one. That little bit of security yeah. is very, very helpful. How much work's involved in running a training day? <laughs> Quite a bit. Uh, well, like a fact, once we get sort of halfway through our bit and piece, not so bad, but it means someone's got to be out there, well, t- a typical Sunday, you've got to be out there at 7 o'clock, get the water cart going, get filled up with water, get the tractor going, get the grader out, all the rest of it, and then start watering the track straight away and actually, so the track's been watered and settled down before all the kids arrive. Then there's things like putting up starting gates out, markers and so on and so forth. There's two or three hours work before you actually start every Sunday. But then once it gets going, everything goes fairly smoothly, so it's not so bad. Track preparation is probably the hardest job in all tracks all over the world. How often do you have to work on your track at Moore Park and, and how does it hold up after a day's racing? Well, one of the secrets of a good track is the day you finish, you relay then. We finish four o'clock Sunday afternoon, so, but we're out straight away, tear up and relay that track completely. Water, roller, everything. And then I hope nine times there's going to be rain. Rain settles the track down lovely and even for the following Sunday. But we always stay and lay that track before we head off home again. It's important. With such a group of young riders that you're dealing with, there's obviously a group of loyal and hopeful parents. How much input and help do these parents give? Well, it helps a lot. It's Well, everyone's got their own views on the kids and, and this and that. But what I look at is, well, but take a brand new kid arrives at the school, put him out on the training bike. Go around, bang, 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 going good. Next week he does the same thing. But then I go up to the parent and I say, yep, he's going to make it. You're going to have to give him a bike. Well, then the parent is going to have to fork out quite a lot of money. So the parent does that. But then I have a private session with the parents to start off with. And they're not to push the kid in any way at all. In fact, I've hit one parent who's ready to kill his kid the way he's pushing him. And then once everything sort of blends in, they get it back into the system or they get it back into my system then, they leave everything to me as far as that side is concerned. It all basically blends in, but it also costs them one hell of a lot. As we said before, of course, the machinery over here is very, very expensive. How do you run Moore Park? Is it run by committees or is it done purely on a social basis? Well, basically, there's two people really, Ted and Wendy, that started this all off and then asked me in to train the kids. Well, they do all the administration side of it, paperwork side, you know, all this kind of stuff that's going to build up on it. But the rest of it is all done by parents. They've all got their own little jobs each Sunday and they automatically go out and they do their job. You don't have to tell them, they do it. But if for some reason they can't come that time, they phone early and then know, and there's another parent that's going to step in straight away and take over that particular job. So it's parents that are not only on the tractor or on the grader, but it's parents that are either on the grader or on the tractor as well, and the water cart and things like that. And they, they've got used to it and know how to do it. So let them, I used to do it all once by the time. Now I can sit back, have a cup of coffee, it's good. <laughs> You've got two tracks at Kerwee, the outer one, which the main riders, the ones that have been there a wee while are on. Of course, you've got the inner track, obviously for the for the younger ones to first get a strider bike. What's the youngest sort of age that you've dealt with there? Six. 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 Incredible. They actually weren't on proper speedway bikes. It's impossible for them to reach. But all these little bikes, <laughs> Hondas and Suzuki's and what they put out now, parents are buying them, so. They're out on the little inner track, well, inner inner track, inside the inner track, but just on the grass and everything, and it develops up. And that's where a couple of them that are now riding at Ruapuna started on that. Basically, I suppose that would be the area that helps them get their balance and everything else yeah. at, at such a young age. Yeah. Okay, the, the school has its own bike. 
from what I can understand, it's gone through various engines. It has. <laughs> what type of engines are you running on the school bike? Yamaha at the moment. Yamaha. But it started off Honda, then it went to another Honda, but that done so many miles and it was stripped and rebuilt, stripped and rebuilt and just got worn out. There's a Yamaha at the moment, but we haven't had that in very long, so that must have good another couple of years. One would hope so. <laughs> I've been out there myself, of course, and I've seen them, and boy, they're pretty hard to get off the track once they're on, aren't they? They are. Very, very keen. It's good to see that, of course. Um, parents pushing them along, but we've talked before that they don't really need to be pushed too hard. Pushing them too hard, does that put them off? Have you lost any riders through being pushed too hard that have given it away? Yeah. It doesn't actually put them off, but it just makes them well try too hard before they've got the ability to do a certain thing. I've got certain stages they got to go through, and they got to perfect that stage first before I'll put them up to the next stage. You know. Some parents are trying to push them onto, say, stage six, where I still want them on stage two before they are perfect for them to move to the next stage. And that's where I've got to go have nasty words. And boy, when I start, I can be nasty too. Are you basically trying to pace the children <clears throat> as you paced yourself in your early years? Mm. Well, to an extent. I mean, I've got to analyse each kid well, totally separately from, from that kid. It's well, just the way they're built internally and all the rest of it. I can tell, well, I can tell six kids how to come into that corner, such and such. But I can't tell those six kids that as a group of six. I've got to tell the individual kid how to do it, totally different to that kid. But actually, like, it's still the same thing, it's just how I'm talking to them. Right. I've got to get down and actually, like, scribble on the track with my finger at times and draw the corner and show them what I mean. And then you can see all of a sudden their eyes light up, it's clicked what I've told them. Where, where I've been telling them before, they've sort of got it, but they, they haven't got it. But they're a drawing, it clicks and they go. We're talking about engines uh, on the speedway, on the school bike, and that they've had to be replaced. Obviously, that's going to cost money. Does this come from voluntary labour and donations? All of it. All of it. Yeah. Okay, obviously there's going to be a certain amount of expense and you've got to have some sort of financing arrangement. How is this done? Through functions, that type of thing? Yep. Uh, in actual fact, on average, well it hasn't been, and not until we've got our new, our permanent track that we've got now. Once a year we put on a meeting. All the top boys they're not kids, they're top sphere guys. They've been out there at different times and ridden our track and they know it and they love it and they all want to come. Sidecar guys, I mean, we put on a meeting. But because we're putting on a meeting, we go through all the different companies in Christchurch and tell them we're putting on a meeting. We don't have to worry now. We have a sponsor for each of those 30 races. Bang, bang, bang. We charge people to come in, they can drive their cars in park right around the track, bang, it's a nasty day, they can even sit in their car and watch. But that way we raise, well, God knows what we raise, but that then, like okay, a new, new blade on the grade or something like that, well we don't go and buy a blade naturally, we make it or someone will make it for us, but there's still a bit of cost in the price of the metal and things like that, so that's what we do, and we just keep going. Most tracks in New Zealand, they run other classes during the meetings, including cars and, and side chairs. How hard is it for them to prepare a track to suit all the classes, and do you think solo racing perhaps suffers because of this? Solo racing definitely suffers. It's impossible, absolutely impossible, to prepare a track to cover all the classes. If, I would say here at Rapuna, it's the New Zealand Solo Championships, well the track has to be prepared for solo racing. There's going to be cars on that night as well, but they've got to accept what has been set for solo. And then there was a big car meeting, and well, the solo boys had to accept what was produced for cars, which was bloody murder as far as solo boys were concerned, but that's it. That's one of the big drawbacks of New Zealand Speedway in actual fact. Very hard to put the wheel out on a drivey track. Definitely. <clears throat> Rupp in a park in Christchurch has led the way by moving and making a separate solo track on the stadium infield, a track that is really not dissimilar in size to English league tracks. 
Do you think that other tracks should be doing the same? Well, they should, but the cost of it. I mean, Christchurch, well, it's the biggest solo centre in New Zealand. We've always got more riders than we can handle as far as a Saturday night meeting is concerned. That's where we have an advantage, solo-wise. But in a lot of other places, they have only the bare number to make up a meeting. They can't afford to lay a separate track inside the car track just for the solo boys. It would be good if they could, because then, well, it might even get the stage where you can go back to teams racing as well. But I can't ever see it happening in actual fact. Years ago, of course, New Zealand solo racing was relatively level from Auckland right down to Invercargill. The, the level was reasonably good. Over the last few years, in other places other than Christchurch, it's tended to drift away. Now, obviously, you've had a fair amount to do with this with the Speedway School. Do you think that other centres should be running the similar sort of idea of the Speedway School? Yeah, well, once upon a time, a few years back now, I used to fly all over New Zealand doing schools. It used to cost me a lot of money in actual fact. So, and then I just had to hit it on the head. But when I was doing those schools, the riders would benefit from it. In fact, even Auckland, the strongest car place in New Zealand, Fred Motors just couldn't believe it when he saw his guys going around after a two day school. He said, Will you come back? And I thought he was pulling me to leg. I said, What in the hell for? People I've never seen these guys going so good. You keep going like this, and I'll keep solos going. Bang. And that's what it needs. I mean, I can't do it all the time. There's got to have other people doing schools. It doesn't matter what country in the world. Schools, well, they're kindergarten. They're teaching pupils to do things the right way from the word go, which is important. Before they start to develop a bad habit, and once they've got that bad habit, they'll never lose it. I notice, of course, that you have no fence at Moorpark. You obviously feel it's a lot safer for training purposes. Is it hard for your riders to switch to a track with a safety fence? No. We haven't got a fence, well, other than the expense of putting up a fence, but that was immaterial. They are going to run off the track every now and again. You've got to accept that, especially learners. But a kid runs off the track, but he comes back over to me, well, I get him back, and I give him hell. Because I said, now, if that was a fence there, you've got a bloody broken neck, you know, and hit him right from the word go. Then explain to him why he run off because he did such and such a thing wrong. I said, now get back out there and do it again. I don't want to see you go off this bloody track again or you're going to kick up the backside. And they don't. So when they get onto a track where it has got a fence, nine times out of ten, they go, no, we're near the fence. They pass around the line, which I want them to do ride the line. It's the shortest way around the speedway track. Well, now that Ruapuna Park solo racing is on the inner track, is it an advantage or perhaps a disadvantage for riders, that, should they go off their line, that they have another track to sort themselves out before getting to the fence? No. Definitely not. In either way? No. All your riders seem to have a great respect for you. How do you get your message through to them when training? Uh, it's just a matter of explaining. I've done it 
with A grade effort when I used to do scores. I found it was the best way then. A simple A, B, C explanation. In fact, I used to say to them, if I tell you something such and such and such, you're not going to understand it. So I'm going to give you a kindergarten lesson. And that's what I used to do. And they would accept that straight away. They were simple, plain, simple A, B, C. They, adults, accept it. Well, if I told them all something, how to do it, but all sort of technical, they just didn't get the bloody message either, in actual fact. So it's got to be really and truly simple. It's got to be the right thing, but explained so simply that it would stand out black and white in front of them, you know. And then you'd drum that into them, and they accept it. And bang, before you know it, they're doing it. You have a certain way of training your riders, obviously, from what you've been talking about. <clears throat> how much training did you get from your father, and how did he get his message across to you? Well, not that much really, because Dad hadn't done damn all speed work himself. I mean, he'd done a few, and of course he had a leg trail, he had to do the big knee hook, and we're both sharing the same bike. Because <laughs> we couldn't take the knee hook off, that was bolted on there. So I could go up as far as the knee hook, and that, that was it. And, well, he had a lot of theory, which he told me, which I put into practice, but it was Norman Parker, when Norman Parker came out to New Zealand, that really started to tell me things and teach me things. And a pro made one hell of a difference. Yes, basically, we were speaking of influence there. You were said to have been a natural, and not many people would argue with that. But in England, when you were there, was there anyone who really influenced your writing? In what way, then? Well, basically, style, anything like that, with people that you were writing with. Did you take any of their style, or just stick with your own way? No, I stuck, well, fundamentally in my own way, because it was, it was just the way I felt natural and comfortable. And though Norman was telling me things, in theory, I found out afterwards, well, basic it was right, but it wasn't 100% right, it was wrong for that particular track and things like that. It was something, oh, well, just it emerged and came out and I, and I learnt. And that's what I want to pass on to the kids here now all the time. Yeah. I was lucky in that things just came out the right way. I've noticed with riders from America being used to the very small tracks, they come out here and full throttle all the way. And then when we've untangled them from the fence, they realise that there's something a little different with the longer tracks. How important is throttle control? Well, it's one of the things I tell the kids out at school. Handlebars. This is not what I say, is it? Handlebars are nothing. It is to hang that throttle on. That throttle should be made of gold. Because the throttle is what steers the bike. It's how you use the throttle. And that's one of the things I teach the kids. Throttle control, how they can come out of the corner faster by easing the throttle off and killing the spin against holding it flat and spinning like hell and getting nowhere. It's so important, it ain't true. It's, well in fact, it's the only way to ride a bike. You've got to have the throttle control.
You of course do the, the basic training on the track and show them the lines and how to come into a turn, how to come out of the turn and, and throttle control will come into that. Do you also deal with the technical side of it like gearing and all that type of thing? Oh yes, definitely. You've got to go into that. It's a little bit hard to start off by explaining to the kids that because they've got that's rock and that's rock and that's all they've got. But then when we go away and do trips to different tracks every now and then which we do, I go explain it all to them. And I go for a walk when we go say to a new track, I walk with them around the track and show them because it's a different shape, different size and different things. If you're on your bike now and you had the curl with gear on, you've got to here, but you're screaming like hell now, not the corners, still up there. That's where you've got to go with the biggest rocket so you can get up to there and you know, all things like that. Been a lot of problem, of course, over here with tracks being different. Drive you one day and slick the next. Oh, goodness. How much does that do to um, learning the technical parts of, of uh, gearing and so forth? It, well, it's just so important, I think, too. Even from the point of view, even out at Rupuna, we have a wet day. We've only ever two Sundays, I think, in seven or eight years we haven't run. Because I want them out on a wet track which is skatey and slippery because they're going to learn and they're really going to learn their sort of control there as well. But that is there, one of the things where I can teach them on changing sprocket, how much difference it's going to make on that particular track. The same track, but the conditions are different, change your sprocket to get it going perfect. So they're all learning that as well. Teaching the rudiments of gating? Yeah, but we go through cycles as we have a, a break, maybe two or three weeks of or do it a little bit. But all of a sudden we have a day just with the gate and fundamentally first corners and they just cruise back and interchanging so they're not in the same position all the time and learning. But I can talk to them between each start or sometimes they'll do two or three then stop and say, well look, you've got to do this and you've got to do that. Bang, bang, bang. And well, they're all a little bit slow to start off with in dropping the clutch and everything else. But now they're all starting to really click and get the idea of it. That is a very important thing, but it's one where you've got to build up gently and gradually on so you don't mess them up and they can really, well, it really gets embedded in there and once they've learned it, they've never ever forgotten it, they've never got it. Right. Training school now has been going for nearly 10 years. What sort of influence has it had on the local speedway? Well, on average, on a Saturday night out at Rapuna, 75 to 80% of the riders are from the school. But that's the influence it's had. If we hadn't had the school, well, I don't think they'd be overstocked in riders like they are at the moment. Like a lot of other top riders, you started up a motorcycle business when you retired, but gave it away after a while. What do you do now for a living? Well, basically, I quit the bike business because I dropped Brigger while he was standing out here. 
and dropped him off the airport one day. He was flying back to England. He said, get out of that motorbike business. I said, what in the hell's the matter with you? He said, you've changed. Get out of that motorbike business. I said, I'll pee off. And I put him on the plane and he went back to England. So I'm driving back to the airport and I started to analyse it. So I called him in the shop and I said, the boys lock up for me tonight. I'm not going to be back. And I went down and sat outside the school where my kids were and I just started to think back. Well, yeah, maybe he's right. I am out. So I saw the other directors and I sold up. Well, the thing that hit me, after I'd been out for a little while, the kid said, Dad, you're changed. I said, well, why? He said, you talk to us now. I said, well, we blink and talk. He said, no, you used to come home with your blink and briefcase and push it out of the room and all this, which was right. So I quit and I thought, well, motorbikes, I've been working seven days a week on that shop. All the things around the house I hadn't been able to do for months. Right, six months off and work on the house. And I put the word out just quietly to two people to circulate. They were in about six months, I'm going to want some kind of job. Three weeks later, I had a phone call from London, from the TV, got the word and wanted to know if I was interested in work. Oh, right. <laughs> I hit that one on the head. And then Alan Brown, he used to ride the Kings then in the old days. Well, he got a foundry just up the road from here, about two miles from here. He came down and saw me and he kept pestering me to go going and working for him. And I told him I knew nothing about foundry, I'd never been in a foundry in my life, I'd, I'd last two weeks. So he kept pestering me and pestering me, so in the end, or more or less to shut him up, I went. I thought, this one won't last long. Uh, that was 15 years ago. <laughs> I was still going strong at the Sounds moment. Quite well. <laughs> what sort of work are you actually doing there, Ronnie? Oh, well that's where I love Alan, and that's why I'm still there. And you're not on one thing all the time. I'm casting things, and whatever, but then I'm machining things, I'm milling things, then I'm making sand cores. And, well, you're varying, you're moving around all the time. You can't get bored because the change, and that's why I'm there. Yep. Well, I had to just go onto a lathe, say. I couldn't stick it, not on a lathe for 15 years. Your life since retirement right, seems to be one of extremes, you're either in the uh, extreme cold or in this case obviously the extreme heat. What sort of heat are you working in here? Uh, metal 800 degrees for, for this particular job. I mean, it varies for different jobs, but for this job it's 800 degrees. And even though it is in the middle of winter, it does get to you, so you've got to take your shirt off, otherwise it's ringing wet. Yeah, it's not a bad sort of body even at this age, is it? Well. One of the things with casting and heat, it's, well, it's like a sauna. You sweat all the dirt out of you, and from that point of view, it's quite good. This is an interesting job, in actual fact. The waterworks got a load of special casting out from Taiwan, 5,000 of them. <laughs> they all broke. So we made up a die, and this is some of the first ones off of it. But they've tested them since then and can't break them, so it looks like I might have about 5,000 of these to do now. What sort of length of time would be um, would it take to make one of those? Oh, basically, it's only three or four minutes per casting, once you've got the heat and everything right. It takes a little while to work up to get your right temperature on the die and everything else, but once you've got it right, then you keep it running. Quite often on a job like this, Alan will come down and take over while I have lunch and then I'll come and take over so we can keep going right through the day and no interruptions to really get the turn out. But it doesn't always work that way. Sometimes you get real foul ups and it's days when you can only get 20 or 30 castings. But on this one it's worked out quite good. Are there many of you working there? Uh, no, it's an actual fact. It's WL Brown and it's all Browns, except for Ronnie Moore. Oh, fair enough. Good family business, obviously. Yeah. That's uh, one of the reasons I like it, and one of the reasons I'll go there at 7 o'clock to get a job out, though officially I don't start at 8 o'clock, because they're terrific people, and they're terrific to work for. Basically, that's why I'm still there. Haven't had any problems with burns or anything like that? Oh, yeah, that's occupational hazard, that's nothing. You get used to that. In fact, 
And the thing is, I can just about pick up red hot metal now. You got so used to that that you just adapt to it. Your body adapts. Obviously, make a saving on matches and cigarette lighters as well. Alan Brown's still getting around quite well, even though he had his bad accident. Oh, yes, he's got a bit of a limp, and in the cold weather, he does notice it a little bit, but um, he's pretty well over it all now. Though he had to go back the other day for an x ray, just to have a little check up, but uh, they reckon he's okay. They put him on a drug for a week. bit of variety. Yeah, well, you can't stay casting all the time. You've got to get on the other job. I'm on the lay, then I'm on the mill, then I'm in making sand cords and things like that. That's what I love about Browns. You're not stuck on one particular job all day. If you were, I don't think I'd be there now. I'd go up the wall. What type of things you're making on here, Ronnie? Uh, actual fact, they're part of an agricultural spray. We do a heck of a lot of agricultural stuff. Uh, well, we've got some things that are painted to right out to New Zealand, and uh, they go down really well. This is a quiet period for agriculture at the moment, in the middle of winter, but we've got to keep everything stocked up so that when the summer comes, we've really got a load of it in stock. With all these great riding years now behind you, what do you miss most about Speedway and being part of it? <sighs> the friends I've made in all different countries all around the world. I mean, well, you just take building the supporters alone. I mean, all the work they've done and the money they raised just to get me back there so that I could say hello to them, you know. And I get one hell of a lot of correspondence and phone calls still from different people all the time and oh, it'd be lovely just to well just go and say hello and have a beer with a few of them again it'd be mighty yeah. the opportunity will arise i'm sure yeah in the not too distant future looking back what did you get most out of your speedway career from day one right through good i don't know, really know it it was a living but it, it was a living, but it wasn't a living. It was, well, it was a way of life, and it was, well, you're travelling. I mean, I don't know about half a million miles by air, just going to speedway meeting and things like that. It, well, it was just a bit of everything. It's hard to explain any single thing. It was, oh, it was just fantastic. Being there all those years, of course, and racing against a lot of internationals, you obviously made a lot of friends, both with uh, riding people and with fans. You were saying before you get letters and, and cards and phone calls from overseas. Are there any real strong friendships that you've got? I mean, you mentioned Obi Funden before, and I know he's a very strong fan, uh, friend of yours. Do you have a lot, a few others around Europe and England? Oh, God, yes. Uh, I'm going back to England in September for the Swapper dinner. They're flying me over there to present me with a trophy. And that... It's now public, it's been made public, you know. Obi phoned him, one of the first ones to phone. He said, right, you come over to Belgium, Obi's living in Belgium. You come over to Belgium to stay with me for a few days. I said, yep, definitely. Yeah. And that has been going on ever since. In fact, it's going to be impossible to fit in all of them in the month I'm going to be there. That's just the way it is, it's terrific. Every chance of that could become a very extended holiday. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, the month could sort of creep more like six months. <laughs> Probably won't be much of a holiday, actually. It'd be more like hard work, wouldn't it? Ah, uh, hard work, but pleasure. So, no, it's not that bad. Catching up with all those great friends of yours. Mm. Obi Fun, of course, you mentioned. Is he into flying as well? Yeah, he's got his own Cessna. So, obviously, he'll fly across to London and pick me up and fly me back to Belgium. And then I'll be able to 
or borrow the set and do it around Europe a little bit as well, you know? Oh, where to go. Okay, you were mentioning uh, before about trophies and uh, no doubt you picked a few up over your years. Mm, yeah, well, you, on open meetings, not that there's a trophy for that. So if you win it, well, you get a trophy. And then, of course, you've got official meetings sometimes where you're getting a plaque or or like world files and things like that where you get an FIM gold medals if you win and stuff like that. But it all adds up in the end. Well, I know for a fact, because we're sitting in this room at the moment, and above us and right around the walls, there is quite a few trophies. And I think it would be a good opportunity to have a look at those. These are just well, individual trophies for open meetings and things like that mainly. I forgot what most of them are for in actual fact. Well, there's a world final one coming up. FIM gold medals, Irish Championship three years, and so it goes on. The rest are basically just individual meetings, different tracks throughout England and Europe. That trophy there is an old one back in 1949, Aranui Speedway. That go back a long way, that one. Most of these ones are continental ones. Oh, that one coming up there, that big one in the middle. That's the Billy Butlin trophy. It was a good one to win that one, one at Southampton. The rest are all continental ones. That's been all made over here in Oxford. Well, there's an oil painting I've done of me at Silverstone in the Cooper. Well, we've got League of Nations now. There's Austria, Denmark, Sweden, England, Poland. In fact, plaques and trophies, well, plaques more than anything else, but just about everywhere. A lot of those bottom ones are at Wembley. Two of those are track records from Wembley. Test match series. Sweden coming up. England, Sweden, England. Poland. Don't even know what the top one is. Well, that was just taken over Wimbledon. Well, while we've been chatting, Ronnie, you've certainly been very modest about a lot of your wins all over the world. But I think as far as New Zealand people are concerned, and even your loyal fans in England, this would have to be the most popular one. This is your first World Championship win in 1954 and we have the big certificate here from the Federation of International Motorsport to prove just what happened in 1954. And with the certificate of course comes the spoils of victory and in this shot we do have the big Sunday Dispatch World Championship trophy held aloft here by a very proud Ronnie Moore. Handsome lad he was and we can understand why he had so many fans. Well, this is not a question, but a statement of fact. You were given the nickname Merrick, and there is no reason to stop using that name. And on behalf of the competitors who you raced with and against, the up-and-coming junior riders, plus all your ever-loyal fans on their behalf, I would like to say thanks for just being you, Ronnie Moore. There is one last question, Ronnie. Any regrets, and would you do it all over again? Mm, that's a good one, Annie. Regrets, yes. But the fun, the pleasure, and the excitement I had as well, I'd definitely do it over again. Mind you, I would love to know what I know now and then do it over again. It would be fantastic. One can understand that. <laughs> Ronnie, thanks very much. It's been a brilliant afternoon. Thank you, Annie.
Well, unfortunately, we don't have the actual World Championship trophy from 1954, but we do have the Sunday Dispatch replica. And, of course, Ronnie, this was probably a proud day for you. And there is that trophy. One thing I've never ever done in this. Cheers to all you Speedway supporters. down that table. <laughs> but it's been such an emotional night tonight. Just from the people here tonight that I've met, I haven't seen for 20 years, but some of them I've known for 40 years. And boy, that really truly hit me in the guts tonight. It really did. Well, you take TR. <laughs> <laughs> Well, anyone can take TR, I can tell you. <laughs> but he, well, he wasn't a daddy, he was like a mum to us. The trouble he got us into was out of this world. Um, I wasn't so bad, but Barry. <laughs> well, I, I, just, I was just going to have a couple of words to say, but I'll tell you a little, little incident. Barry, we all lived in the same house up in Sutton, and we're riding for Wimbledon. And Barry is doing his own bike. <laughs> <coughs> and he put the slide in the carburetor back to front. So he's pushing it up and down the road and of course it won't start. And T.R. said, I'll tell you how it's up. But no, I'm, I'll fix it, I'll fix it, I'll fix it. It finished up, it was, oh, I don't know, about quarter past seven or so. Women started at eight o'clock in those days. We go inside. And Barry stripped off and he said to you, right, how, how do we fix it? How does it start? And T.R. said, out on the road. Well, there was a block of police flats right opposite. Barry had to go outside on the road, start by lake, and ask T.R. how to fix the bike. <laughs> so T.R. told him how to put the slide around the right way and then close the door on him. Well, Barry, he wouldn't go around walk in the back door, he stood at the front door for 10 minutes, banging on it, had a whole street out, watching him stark while they trying to get into, into the house. <laughs> Things like that went on all the time. <laughs> then, well, I just don't want to name people to hear. It's, it's, oh, it's screwing me up tight. There's a few things I would like to thank. Well, Swapper, Oh, this, this is really fantastic. Phil Rising especially. Phil was on the phone a lot to me, sorting all this out. And then when I come over, I borrowed his car. Two days later, someone had smashed the window and picked the telephone out of it, but he didn't mind, so that was OK. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he doesn't realise it, but there's 8,000 miles I've gone up on the clock since he's loaned it to me, and I'm not giving it back to him for another week. <laughs> but that doesn't matter either. Uh, BAC, especially. Through them, I'm here, and I only hope to hell they'll fly me home next Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> and really, there's only one other person I'd like to thank, and that's Jockey Underwear for their support. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Great to see you again. Let's take you back, Ronnie, to those early days of Wimbledon. What are your first memories of coming over to Britain? Well, my very first memory was walking into the stadium at the wrong end. And it was practice day at Wimbledon. This was in 1950. 
and I walked in the gate at the far end and there's Dickie Harris coming down the straight and his handlebars are come off and he went straight through the fence. Well, that's nice. <laughs> so we went round to the pits and Norman Parker was there and Norman had arranged for me to come over. So uh, he arranged for me to borrow a bike off Mike Erskine. Good as gold. So I said, I don't ride. how do I ride? He said, flat. So I went out and I managed two laps before I done Dickie Harris and finished up on the dog truck as well. But uh, Tommy Price was there also. And Tommy then told me how to ride the truck. So I rode round and Ronnie Green was impressed. I didn't know what was going on, so next thing I've got a contract, so things worked. That must have been good for you. Now, let's, let's take you back even further now, Ronnie. Let's take you back to New Zealand on the Cycle Speedway. Oh, hell. <laughs> well, there was just a vacant lot, so we cut up a bit of a track, and we just sort of blasted around on bikes and things like that. And then Barry Briggs come to enjoy us, a few others come to enjoy us. But from that cycle speedway, 90% of those kids finished up either on solos or sidecars back in Christchurch on the speedway. Two of them also got killed. But that's one of those things. Well, it is. I mean, you, you really put Christchurch on the map speedway-wise. You, you were the pioneer, the big first name, Ronnie. How do you feel about that? A lot to live up to, surely. Well, it was good as far as the New Zealand flag was concerned. But a world final, well, to me it was just another meeting, it was a world final. But to wave New Zealand flag was good. So, bang, that was nothing. Uh, I got pleasure out of it naturally, but not, oh, it was nothing special, it was, it was just another meeting. And to win it was nice, but uh, not, well, I just couldn't get, screwed up tight over something like that. It was just an individual meeting. And any individual meeting, it's the luck of the draw and your luck on that particular night to whether you win or not. I was lucky on those nights, that's all. Well, you've inspired a lot of speedway riders, not only from New Zealand, Ronnie, but also from Britain as well. That must be a great feather in your cap to watch at your protégés coming good now. Uh, I don't really know. No. See, today, well, I mean, over here at the moment, a truck, well, they just haven't got any dirt on them, and they're slick, and people ride round them, but they only got to do a smell of corn, and the bike will turn itself. Back in the old days, you had dirt on the track, you had to make the bike turn, and there was a rider's ability to get round the corner. These days, you smell a corner, and the bike goes round by itself, but it's too much of a procession. Are we saying it's too easy then, Ronnie? Oh. I don't know. I don't really know. In fact, I've had too many beers tonight to know anything that much. <laughs> <laughs> if you take your mind back, Ronnie, to all those fabulous meetings you rode in, is there any one particular meeting which sticks out in your mind? Your favourite ever meeting? No, not really. All I was interested in those days was Wimbledon as a team winning and winning the league, which we did for quite a few years on the trot. That was the most important thing in life for the whole team. I got much more pleasure out of a team winning than me going out and winning an individual meeting. That, is, that surprises me, Ronnie. It really does, because you've been a world champion. That must have been a great feather in your cap to stand on the rostrum, to know you are the world's best. Damn, no. It's, it's another meeting. That's all it is, another meeting. And to be lucky to win on that particular night, you've got to have the right draw. Everything's got to go right for you to win that day. It's well, your ability to a certain extent but the luck has got to be with you that night to win. That's where a world final by right should be like motor racing, where you're going to go through so many blinking meetings over a season, and then you get a world champion. Well, I know recently you popped in to see the Dons, who are now based at Eastbourne, Ronnie. That must have been quite a shock for you. It was a shock, but that also was the best meeting I've seen in England this year. There was dirt on that track, there was racing and there was teams riding. And boy, that makes a hell of a bloody difference. It must have been very sad to you, Ronnie, seeing that Wimbledon had finally finished. It had closed down at Plough Lane. Well, when I heard about that, I nearly didn't come to England. I was ready to cancel this trip, in fact. Uh, they reckon I wasn't worth living with for a, about a week. 
but then I start to analyse things like it's life, it's progress, it's everything else. And that's it, so then I did come. I'm bloody glad I did come too now. Well, we're always <laughs> pleased to see you, of course, such a, a legend in, a, in the Speedway world. You really are. You must know that, though, Ronnie. Well, thanks very much. Well, I, you are to me, anyway. I mean, I, I remember vividly seeing you ride uh, not only in the 50s, but back in the 70s when you turned out for Wimbledon as well. And dare I say it, Ronnie, quite an old man turning a wheel then. Uh, nah, not really. But I feel old tonight with all these people I've seen here that I knew 40 years ago. That's really hit me, that has. <laughs> what do you think of today's current world champions? Uh, it's hard to analyse because, I mean, I mean out of touch. I'm 12 out of all on the other side of the world. I read things. Yeah. But... Well, it all depends on the press boys to what they write, in actual fact, that gives me my impressions. And my impression can be so wrong, it just ain't true. What are you up to now, then, Ronnie? What are you doing now? Uh, I'm working for a friend of mine who's got a foundry. I went there oh, 15 years ago to give him a hand for a couple of weeks, and I've never left the place, in actual fact. And there is a nice, tidy lump of contracts sitting back there now, waiting for me when I get back. So I'm heading back next Wednesday, and I'm going to be working like a dog for about two months to catch up on everything. You still got a very active life then? Oh yeah, because I mean, I'm doing training schools and everything else while I'm out there. Any time I can get a, a go in a tiger moth or something like stunt flying and stuff like that I do, and all the odds and thuds. And then I love land rows and disappearing up in the mountains and trying to turn them upside down and things like that. It's fun. And you also breathe. It's fun? Oh yeah, it's good fun. It's terrific. <laughs> I'll take your word for it. I wouldn't wish to be your passenger. Oh, no, it, it's OK. As long as you have more than one Land Rover with you, so if one turns over, the other one's there, they'll pull it back on four wheels again, and then you can carry on again. It's fun. <laughs> it sounds like fun for Ronnie Moore, one-time Wall of Death rider. No, no. It's, it's just to break tension, to get away from the everyday run of life and everything else, and you breathe again, and that's what's good. I'm sure you're right. Ronnie Moore, it's wonderful to see you. Thank you very much. Thank you.